Now, we have to explain what we understand by terms like planet and planetary influence. Astronomy and astrophysics occupy themselves, apart from other researches, with seven coagulates to which we will give the names corresponding to the bodies of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon. Many other branches of science occupy themselves extensively with an eighth object, the body of the Earth. That is not our aim in this work. Along with the image of each of these coagulates, that is, the bodies of the planets, we will still connect two pairs of concepts, one of which belongs to the astral plane and another to the mental plane. Therefore, on the Earth, apart from its body in the physical world, we will seek after its genius and astrosome in the astral plane, and its spirit and angel in the mental one. 1. According to our hermetic tradition, the spirit of the Earth is the synthesis of the spiritual stimulus of humanity in relation to its planet. At the present time, the spirit of the Earth is the synthetic idea of our civilizing strivings in an effort to reform our relations with the planet. This means the idea of their happy improvement. 2. The angel of the earth is the ideological part of the resistance which earthly karma shows against human strivings. C. 1. The spirit of the earth is evolutionary, but the angel is involutionary. When the great tragedy of the binary of the earth, spirit angel, will be solved by the neutralization of that binary, by agreement between its elements, then the problem of the Earth's evolution will be solved in principle. 3. The genius of the Earth is the synthesis of all the forms in which the spirit realizes its evolutionary ideas. These are the forms, as well as the formal methods which humanity realizes as a system for the shaping of the Earth for humanity's own aims. 4. The astrosome of the Earth is that synthetic astral turbulon which on the astral plane opposes the genius of the planet and fights against him, trying to obstruct the aims of the angel. The neutralization of the binary genius astrosome of the earth gives the formal solution to the problem called the evolution of the earth. But, rather as a matter of theory, it does not quite give the final solution of the problem, for it must be related to the neutralization of another mysterious binary. Body of earthly humanity? body of the earth. If, in principle, neutralization of the highest binary may be termed the kingdom of God on earth, then the second binary is neutralized as the kingdom of God in forms, and the third, the kingdom in nature, matter. On each of the seven planets, there is a similar scheme. Each planet has a spirit, an angel, a genius, and an astrosome and its own kind of inhabitants, instead of human beings as on our earth, no matter whether of the animal, vegetable, or mineral kingdoms in accordance with the particular planet's own evolution. The hermetic conception of different kinds of humanity being present on all the planets is much broader than that of official science, especially as it was at the beginning of this century. It avers that immaterial, immortal, and illimitable consciousnesses cannot be limited in the choice and creation of the forms in which it may be expressed. We are living, for example, under a very limited and poor range of temperature, about 100 degrees centigrade, or much less, if we ignore the artificial arrangements which we make to smooth over these limitations. I am speaking of clothes, heating appliances, and so on. The temperature of our body cannot vary more than 5 degrees centigrade, or we die. But on other celestial bodies, there are colossal temperatures which do not occur on our Earth, and still matter exists, although in other combinations and conditions. So why cannot some kinds of consciousnesses, souls as we like to say, choose conditions most suited to them? Why should their astrosomes not build bodies? which can resist temperatures of, say, 100,000 degrees and capable of swimming in the fiery atmospheres of stars as we do in our own rivers and seas? 
Hermetic science is far from being attached to the anthropomorphism. It is our unconscious geocentric point of view, which does not allow us to take a much more progressive and broader outlook on life in this immense, infinite universe. Tradition says that planetary life on other celestial bodies, even if understandable to a few very advanced adepts of occultism, cannot be explained in our earthly language. We can realize only those elements of planetary life which are reflected in some definite forms in the realm of earthly existence. Astrology, the Kabbalah, and magic speak clearly only about the influences of the spirit, genius, and so on, of another planet, but not about its true being and nature. We can judge the character of our acquaintances only according to how they appear to us in relation to ourselves. We may know very little about their domestic lives. We will place these incomplete characteristics into an analogous position as regards to the secondary causes, giving them planetary names. Do not forget that important mythological egregors having the names of the ancient gods of Greece and the Roman Empire were in close astral relation with the planetary entities in the form in which they manifested themselves in different epochs. And this supported and fortified the gods. But, the planetary entities changed their outlook according to the progress of their evolution, while the gods were more bound to their primary forms, so that the ties loosened with each passing century. Because of his desire to restore the ancient gods to their original greatness, a great initiate occultist and ascetic, a Roman emperor whom Christians called Julian Aposta, performed a unique evocation of the mythological egregors of the then recent past, one or two centuries earlier. And what did he see? A sad procession of sick, emaciated, and powerless gods. The magician evidently could not suffer such a bitter disappointment over his most cherished ideas. He tried still once more to reverse the wheel of history. His idea was to try and subdue the whole of the then known world, which in the majority was still pagan, so that he could have better conditions in which to fight the young but powerful egregor of Christianity and so revive the ancient cults. He followed the path of Alexander the Great to the east. Deep inside Persia he defeated its king, but triumphant in victory he launched a fiery pursuit of the fleeing enemy hordes, accompanied by only a handful of bodyguards whose horses alone could keep up with the terrific speed of the young emperor's steed. He had discarded his battle helmet and usual heavy armor, being convinced that his egregor would protect him against any physical disaster. But some Persians who were despairingly fleeing from his sword turned and showered his small group with arrows and stone missiles. A slightly ironical smile appeared on the lips of the mortally wounded Julian, when his generals told him of the victory and annihilation of the enemy's army. And when he pronounced his famous, Thou hast conquered, Christ of Galea, he proved himself great enough to recognize his own personal defeat, which was much more important to him. The artificial effort to revive the dying egregors could not have been successful, and so it is even in our own time. After this short digression, we can pass on to an enumeration of planetary influences and their reflections. Imagine seven secondary causalities reflected in the triangle of the primary causalities in the form of three columns, as in figure 26. The planets in the right column are recognized as good, those of the left as evil. Of the sun we may see that it is synthetic, of Mercury that he adapts himself while the moon is passive. The sun in relation to the moon will be a male element, fecundating it through the intermediary of Mercury. We also term Mars, Apollo, Sun, Saturn, and Jupiter as male planets. But according to purely mythological conceptions, Venus and the moon are female. Mercury may be spoken of as androgynous, which agrees with its role of mediator in fecundation. 
These seven secondary causalities are shown with their most important analogies in the table in figure 27, and the necessary commentary follows in the next lesson.